All right, if I can get everybody's attention. We're so glad to see you all here with us this evening. My name is Lisa Cochran, and I work at Texas School for the Deaf under the outreach program. And I'm here this evening at the Austin Library. We wanted to do something for Deaf Awareness Week, and so Austin Library reached out to TSD asking us if we were interested in partnering, and so here we are tonight. We've made our preparations for this event, pulled in some different performers, and so tonight they will be showing you their talents. We're very excited about this event, so thank you all for joining us this evening. And so before we get started, we do have a special guest who will be acting as our master of ceremony tonight. Any guesses as to who that is? This is someone who is born deaf, went to a mainstream program, who did not know sign language growing up. It was not until they went into Gallaudet that they began to learn American Sign Language. And of course, they also loved to listen to music growing up. So as they went to Gallaudet and learned ASL, they became very immersed in the hip hop community. And so you perhaps have seen this person's vlogs and music. Any guesses as to who? Please welcome up to the stage, Matt Maxey. Enjoy yourselves this evening. Thank you for that introduction. No I appreciate problem. it. Hey there, everybody. How are y'all doing this evening? Good. It's so good to be back in Texas. I haven't been in Texas in about two years now. How do I know that I'm back in Texas? Is because I see the Dallas cowboy hats all around. I'm like, yep, I'm definitely back in Texas. And I hear conversations about football. Yep, I'm definitely back in the great state of Texas. So we're here at the Central Library to help you enjoy and have a good night this evening. I hope you're looking forward to all the performances this evening. And we have all the stars tonight here to perform for all of you. And they're real stars tonight. Are you ready to get this, thing, this show on the road? I'm not starting with a song. I'm not starting with a song. Let's go back. I guess we're going to kick off with some music. And once I'm done, all the other performers will be performed. I'm really excited to see all the talent tonight. And I hope that your eyes get a real treat seeing the poems, the stories, and all the music performed in American Sign Language. Now I can't hear, you gotta turn it up. I can't even hear the interpreters right now. And we back. 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 And we And we back. And we back. This ain't no intro, it's the entree Hit that intro with Kanye, I sound like Andre Tryna turn my baby mama to my fiance She like music, she from Houston, like Auntie Yonsei Man, my daughter couldn't have a better mother If she ever find another, you better love her Man, I swear my life is perfect, I can merge it If I die, I'll probably cry in my own service This is a 
life might be your way But that don't take nothing away Cause at the end of the day Music is all we got Music's all we got Rhythm is all we got oh, no, no, no. So we might as well give it all we got So that's the end. I've actually never performed that song before, so I wanted to try something different and something new. I feel that everywhere I go, and I wanted it to become a more personable and personal experience, not something that you've already seen on my blogs or on the internet. I wanted something specially for you here in Texas. Oh, we watched Matt perform one song, All We Got. And that's what y'all can say, too. So all of your performers tonight, it's a special VIP for tonight. First up, we have Meg Rose. I've personally seen her videos on the internet before, and I've watched them, and wow, her expression is just incredible, especially with the gospel music. I'll just sit here and stay in my lane while she does that. And anytime I watch her, I'm just like, wow, oh, you got it. So I'm really excited to see her perform this evening for all of you. Hello, everyone. The song that I'm performing tonight is Broken and Beautiful. So we signed this, Broken and Beautiful. I'm sure that you all love Kelly Clarkson. Am I right? Oh, my goodness. Just wonderful. Her heart just expressed right there in her music. You can just feel it. And so I'm going to try to do that justice tonight. I, I need the volume up too, all right? I never had my hand up and asked for something free. I got proud I could roll up for miles in front of me. I don't need your help and I don't need sympathy. I need you to lower the bar for me I know I'm super warm I know I'm strong I know I've got this cause I've had it all along I'm phenomenal And I'm enough I don't need you to tell me who to be
Keep those applause going, everybody. I felt that. Oh my gosh, I felt like I broke my knee or something, just encapsulated by that energy. Wow, that was beautiful. This is where I'm supposed to make a joke, I guess. Can y'all help me look good and, and laugh at my joke? Just laugh. You don't even, no reason, just laugh. We have one student that was supposed to perform the giving tree, but that student is sick today. And so now we have another student who is waiting to be done with uh, football practice and they will come here and perform. Uh, wait, is the student here? Have they arrived? Oh, they haven't, they haven't arrived yet. So they're going to practice, or once they're done with practice, they will come here and perform the giving tree. Our next performer is Andrew Daly, and he'll be performing alligator. Chomp, chomp, chomp. Oh, looking pretty good up on screen. Hmm. All right, so now this story, I should let you know, this is actually not one of mine. When I was a little boy, um, if you remember the old-fashioned VHS tapes, put them in the VCR. I can remember watching film with a gentleman who was telling an ASL story. I was completely taken back. It was one of my first experiences seeing an ASL story. I was in a mainstream program growing up, and that particular story has stuck with me all this time. So just FYI, this is not my story, but I will do a retelling of that for you. It's entitled Alligator. One beautiful morning, the teacher walked into the classroom and said, good morning, everyone. And the kids all said, good morning, teacher. Now the students were talking about the word transportation you know transportation how to get from one place to another some of the examples that they asked for you know what do you think transportation is um um 
When my parents drive me to school? Yes, exactly, that's right, when your parents bring you to school. What other examples of transportation? Suddenly the kids were all saying, oh, but what about the taxi? The taxi is an example. And someone else said, you know, when we bike, those are, you know, those are forms of transportation. And then you, me, wait, me? Um, um, alligators. I sa say again? Yeah, alligators. You know, that's how I get to school, is on an alligator. So the teacher looked puzzled and said, wait just a minute, I need to go into the hallway and get my assistant. So the teacher went out in the hallway and called for her assistant to come into the room. And they deliberated a bit and the assistant teacher said, he said, alligator? Oh, okay, you know, I know that boy. Let me go and talk with him. So the two of them walked into the classroom and tapped the boy on the shoulder. He said, so what are you talking about today? You're talking about transportation. What is that exactly? I already told you. I don't want to say it again. Come on, just say it again for me. Ugh. Alligator. You know, a green alligator with the big eyes and the big tail with the humps along its back. An alligator. I'm a bit confused. So the two teachers went out into the hallway again to discuss what to do about the situation. And suddenly they saw the principal and they said, principal, will you please come over? And the principal was a big burly man with a suit and tie and he walked over and they were talking about what to do about this. And the principal said, he said, alligator? Oh, what a silly boy. Okay, I know what to do. So he straightened his tie and jacket and went into the room. And he tapped the boy on the shoulder very hard. The boy, the boy looked up. So we were just telling this story. You said alligator, is that true? Yes, exactly, I've already told both of them and now I'll tell you again? Just explain to me, what do you mean by alligator? Uh, okay, an alligator has the big teeth, white and shining teeth, and big eyes and a green tail with the humps along its back that he can whip his tail back and forth, you know, an alligator. And the principal just stood puzzled. Okay. And so he and the teacher and the assistant teacher all went out to discuss again. They just don't understand what this boy means. Maybe we should punish him. Maybe we should shake it out of him and then he'll understand. You know, maybe we could give him electric shock treatment. I, I, the principal said, well, maybe, maybe the bus supervisor would understand better. They supervise the bus system. And so the bus supervisor was this old man with white hair, very long, with, with rubber bands all down his hair. Hey, what's going on? So they, they said, what was going on with the story and they, you know, they said, what, what was going on on the bus this morning? He rode the bus with you, is that right? Um, let me review. He looked in his notes, saw my name there. Yeah, he was on the bus this, every morning and afternoon. Exactly, okay, so the teacher, the assistant teacher, the principal, and now the bus supervisor, all four of them walked in into the classroom, tapped the boy on the shoulder, he looked over and saw all of them standing there. And the bus supervisor said, just let me, let me handle this, let me take care of this. I know, you rode the bus this morning and now you're saying that you ride an alligator? No, 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 alligators. You know, the green with the eyes and the teeth and the tail and the humps. That, you know, an alligator, not a bus. I was on an alligator. Okay, so they walked out of the room, the teacher, the assistant teacher, the principal, and the bus supervisor, and they all tried to talk about it. They said, no, we're gonna call his mother. We're gonna call her to come in. The mother drove very quickly, but it took an hour for her to arrive, and she was in a panic. 
No, no, no. There's nothing wrong with my son. There's nothing wrong. We're trying to figure out why, what does he mean by alligator? The mom was confused. Alligator? So now, you know, the teacher that was there this morning said that she was trying to explain transportation, you know, going back and forth with bicycles, taxis, cars. But your son, what? What did my son say? He said alligator. Alligator? What? Uh, come in with me and, and you can see. So now all five of them walked into the classroom, tapped the boy on the shoulder. Oh, mom! No, no, hold on, honey. Oh, but, um, oh, what? what? Do you mind explaining to your mother what you mean by alligator? Ugh. Mom, okay, I've already explained this to all of these other people. You know, alligator. Okay, mom. So this morning, when I got up, there was a green alligator with white sparkling teeth, big eyes, a big tail, and humps down its back. It was a big scary alligator, you know? And his mom thought for a moment. Oh, I know, yes, alligator, that's right. And the principal and the teacher and the assistant teacher and the bus supervisor were just aghast. Ah, uh, yes, no, okay, so let me explain. You know my son, he's young. He doesn't quite understand all of the bus's colors, you know, he, he can't read the numbers. So he sees the picture of the alligator on the side of the bus and he knows that that's the right one to get on in the morning and the afternoon. That's what he means by alligator. Oh, that's the alligator story. Oh, that was a funny story, wasn't it? I was laughing, I was watching, thinking, what's the point of this? And then I was like, LOL, oh my God, I get it now. I also realized I made a mistake and a misunderstanding on the uh, list of order. We will now have Lisa Cochran. She will be signing the story. A snake mistake. A snake mistake. So I'm curious to see. I guess we seem to have an animal theme going on tonight. All right, let's enjoy. All right, hey everybody. So the book that I'll share with you tonight is one of my favorites. Honestly, I have a whole host of favorites, but this is definitely one of them. It is entitled, A Snake Mistake. Any guesses as to what this mistake might be? It looks like we have some folks out there. A snake swallowed something, a light bulb, and choked. So the author of this is Mavis Smith. And it's not a nice, sweet story. This is based on a true story. So if you have any doubts, Hop on Google tonight, you'll see it there. They show pictures of the actual snake. All right. Farmer Henry was worried. His chickens were not laying enough eggs. So he went to the library and took out a book. And it said chickens will lay more eggs if you put fake eggs in their nests, he read. We have a fake egg right here. If you put our, the chickens and let them roost, they may lay more eggs. So now Farmer Henry knew just what to do. He couldn't find any eggs, but he found a box of old light bulbs. Eh, it's about egg-shaped, right? These bulbs will make very good fake eggs, he said to himself and place them in all the chickens' nests. I hope this works, said Farmer Henry. I want eggs, lots of them. Jake the snake wanted eggs too. 
he slithered up to the chicken coop. And when the chickens saw Jake, they went wild. Jake slithered to the first nest he saw. He opened his mouth wide and gulped down his dinner. Farmer Henry heard the chickens squawking. Cluck, cluck, cluck. He ran out of the house as fast as he could. And there was Jake, propped up against a rock and going nowhere. You look like one sick snake, said Farmer Henry. But, serves you right, you shouldn't have been in my chicken coop. Farmer Henry put Jake back on the ground and started towards the house, but he soon turned around. He knew he couldn't just let Jake lie there and suffer. He picked him up and said, I'll take you to the animal hospital. Maybe the vet will know what to do with you. Farmer Henry put Jake on the examining table. The doctors stretched him out. Hmm, very unusual, said the first doctor. Hmm, said the second doctor. He took an x-ray. Very unusual, said the first doctor. Hmm, said the second doctor. We must operate right away, they said together. Farmer Henry waited a long time outside the operating room. He read magazines and played cards and he thought about Jake. Finally, the doctor came out. Is Jake all right, he asked. And the doctor said, he's all right now, but it's lucky we operate on before the bulbs inside his stomach broke. Farmer Henry followed the doctor to the recovery room. There was Jake, lying in a special incubator and hooked up on machines. Farmer Henry was upset. I meant to fool the chickens, he said, but not Jake. The doctor said Jake could leave the hospital. He is good as new, and we have a little present for you. That night, Farmer Henry threw a big party to celebrate. You know what we have in the box? Any guesses as what we have? These are the bulbs that were actually in the snake's stomach. That's what the doctors gave him. And sure enough, that's a true story. <laughs> Round of applause for that one. Hopefully you enjoyed that story and enjoyed all the stories so far. And when I watch I just, I'm just in awe at how beautiful American Sign Language is. I admit in and I admit in Florida and Georgia, I understand, the ASL there. I understand the ASL there, but here in Texas, it's just so beautiful. Next up on our list, we have Holden Ewan. And he will be performing the bravest Opfi. Yep. We look forward to it. Hi. Can I see everybody's hands? My name's Holden. And the story I'm going to tell today is the bravest Opihi. Once upon a time, Ikeka and Nani decided to swim at a beach shaped like the smile of a moon. Before they left home, their mother warned, don't go too far out. Don't go where it's deep and cold, where you can't see the bottom. But once they were there and having fun, the children forgot what their mother said. 
Not realizing it, they soon wandered far out in the dark blue ocean. From underneath the rolling waves, a giant eel called the Great Puhi saw the children kicking and splashing. The children didn't know they were being watched. Suddenly, the Great Puhi wrapped himself up around Ikeka's legs and pulled the boy under. That right there is the eel. Help, please help, Ikeka screamed, but the great Puhi was big. He was strong. He dragged Ikeka down, down, down to the bottom of the ocean, and there he hid Ikeka in a cave. Nani, frightened but brave, dived after them, but she could not save her poor brother. The great Puhi was too big and too strong. She couldn't fight him. The giant eel swam back and forth in front of the cave where he held Ikeka and guarded it well. Nani turned to the sea creatures for help. Please help me save my brother, she cried. A baby shark came swimming towards her. What's wrong, he asked. I'm so happy to see you, little Manio, Nani said. Please help me save my brother from the great Puhi. You're a shark. You can scare him easily. Who, me, asked the shark. I can't fight the great Puhi. I'm only a baby shark. The great Puhi is too big for me. He's strong. Wait until I grow up. Then I can help you. Nani swam away, disappointed. Help me, she cried out. Please help me save my brother. A sea turtle, a Hanu, popped her small head through the moving waves and looked around. Who's there, she asked. It's me, said Nani. Please help me save my brother from the great Puhi. You're asking me? asked the Hanu. I'm too small to help you. The great Puhi is too big for me. He's too strong. With a shake of her head, the Hanu swam away. Just then, the waves broke up and flew a small school of flying fish. As they swept through the air, Nani quickly asked, please help me, help me save my brother from the great Puhi. The leader of the Malolo sailed by, I'm sorry, but we cannot. The great Puhi is too big and too strong. Nani swam back towards the beach. Too scared to go back home, she climbed on some lava rocks near the shore to think about how she could save her brother. She thought hard and long, but all she could do was cry. Two limpets, Opahai, who lived on the rocks near the pounding waves, heard her wailing. Who's that crying so loudly? These right here, those are the Opahai. They're small, they're cute. Who's that crying so loudly? We can't sleep, one of them yelled, pounding on his shell. He peeked from the tiny shell house he carried upon his back to see what the noise was about. The two opaihai were so tiny they looked like small black pebbles. Nani, sobbing so hard, shook the opaihai in their houses. Her cries were even louder than before. Now, now, don't cry like that. You're breaking our hearts, said one of the opaihai. Tell us what's wrong. Maybe we can help you. My brother has been captured by the great Puhi, and no one is brave enough to help save him. We can help you, said the other opaihai. You, asked Nani, but how can you help me? You're so much smaller than the other animals I've asked. We may be small, but see how we can hold onto the rocks when the large waves come in? Humph, don't give up. Let us at least try, they replied. We want to help. Oh, I don't know. You really think you can, asked Nani. We can try, the opaihai said, nodding. Oh, thank you, she said, clapping her hands and wiping her eyes. The two opaihai dropped themselves off their rock home and fell deep, deep into the ocean. Down, down, down they went, past the yellow, green, blue, and red fishes, past the white and pink fans of coral, past the long, dark tongues of seaweed, past the dark rocks and caves open like mouths. In the deep ocean, all the plants and animals were large and strange. Brave as they were, the opaihai trembled in their shells. 
After a long search, the Opaihai finally found the great Puhi and his cave. He was still guarding it. Ikeka, looking small and frightened, sat inside. When the giant eel was not looking, the Opaihai attached themselves very quietly to his tail. Then they climbed up his long, slippery body. After long and tiring climbing up and sliding down, they reached the great Puhi's head. There, the Opaihai passed the eel's wide, terrible mouth, which was filled with needle-sharp teeth. They shuddered at the thought of falling in. They were also frightened of his nose that sucked in water. How awful it would be if they were caught in a swirl and seen by the great Puhi. Finally, the Opaihai came to the great Puhi's beady little eyes, and they shouted, Now! And they slid over an eye, covering them. I can't see, cried the great Puhi. He spun around and around. Help me, he cried out. Help me, I can't see. I'm blind, I'm blind. This way and that, up and down, over and under, he went. As the great Puhi turned over and over, the Opaihai hung on tighter and tighter and tighter. Something has swallowed the sun, screamed the great Puhi. Hang on, hang on, they called each other as they thrashed around. Don't let go. Because the great Puhi could not see, Nani was able to swim past the terrible eel and save her brother. Mahalo, mahalo, the children shouted to the Opaihai as they swam past the great Puhi. You are both so brave, the children shouted. Hurry, hurry, cried the Opaihai as they swirled and twirled around and around with the great Puhi like a pinwheel. Ikeka and Nani swam out of the deep ocean and reached land safely. After many, many days of waiting, Ikeka and Nani saw the two little Opaihai climb out of the sea. Are you all right? asked the children. Oh, we're fine, they said. Traveling up takes much longer than going down. When all the sea creatures learned of their bravery, they began to sing. Yes, anyone can be brave. Look at the Opaihai. You don't have to be big and strong to be brave. You don't have to be big and strong to be brave. And the Opaihai's story spread throughout the oceans. Doesn't matter, big or small, you can do it with bravery. Thanks. Did y'all enjoy that story? Wow, it doesn't matter how big or small you are. What's important is that what you have in your heart and how motivated you are and how success can be your goal. That's what I took away from that story. Very beautiful. Next, we have Kaylee Cubes with her song, A Million Dreams by Pink. Thank you. 
Yes, you're picking it up. I see a round of applause. That was beautiful. Next, we have Huey Zhang with the five Chinese brothers. Thank you. My name is Huey Zhang, and I'll be signing this book entitled The Five Chinese Brothers, and that's by Claire Huguet Bishop. Once upon a time, there were five Chinese brothers, and they looked exactly alike. They lived with their mother in a little house not far from the sea. There they are. There's the brothers. The first Chinese brother could swallow the sea. The second Chinese brother had an iron neck. The third Chinese brother could stretch and stretch and stretch his legs. The fourth Chinese brother could not be burned, and the fifth Chinese brother could hold his breath indefinitely. Every morning, the first Chinese brother would go fishing, and whatever the weather, he would come back to the village with beautiful and rare fish, which he had caught and would sell at the market for a very good price. One day, he was leaving the market. A little boy stopped him and asked him if he could go fishing with him. No, it could not be done, said the first Chinese brother. But the little boy begged and begged, and finally the first Chinese brother consented. Under one condition, said he, and that is that you shall obey me promptly. Yes, yes, the little boy promised. There he is, fishing. Early next morning, the first Chinese brother and little boy went down to the beach. Remember, said the first Chinese brother, you must obey me promptly. When I make a sign for you to come back, you must come back at once. Yes, yes, the little boy promised. Then the first Chinese brother swallowed the sea. And all the fish were left high and dry at the bottom of the sea, and all the treasures of the sea lay uncovered. The little boy was delighted. He ran here and there, stuffing his pockets with strange pebbles, extraordinary shells, and fantastic algae. The first brother held the whole sea. Near the shore, the first Chinese brother gathered some fish while he kept holding the sea in his mouth. Presently, he grew tired. It was very hard to hold the sea. So he made a sign with his hand for the little boy to come back. The little boy saw him, but paid no attention. He kept holding and holding and holding and held some more. The first Chinese brother made great movements with his arms and meant come back. But did the little boy care? Not one bit. He ran further away. Then the first Chinese brother felt the sea swelling inside him and he made desperate gestures to call the little boy back, but the little boy made faces at him and fled as fast as he could. The first Chinese brother held the sea until he thought he was going to burst. All of a sudden, the sea forced its way back out of his mouth, went back to bed, and the little boy disappeared. When the first Chinese brother returned to the village home alone, he was arrested, put in prison, and tried and condemned to have his head cut off. On the morning of the execution, he said to the judge, Your Honor, will you allow me to go and bid my mother goodbye? It's only fair, said the judge. So the first Chinese brother went home, and the second Chinese brother came back in his place. So he bowed to the judge, the second Chinese brother. All the people were assembled on the village square to witness the execution. The executioner took his sword and struck a mighty blow. But the second Chinese brother got up and smiled. He was the one with the iron neck and they simply could not cut off his head. Everybody was angry and they decided he should be drowned. Whew. On the morning of the execution, the second Chinese brother said to the judge, Your Honor, will you allow me to go and bid my mother goodbye? It's only fair, said the judge. So the second Chinese brother went home, and the third Chinese brother came back in his place. He was pushed on a boat which made for the open sea. 
So again, bowing to the judge. And they went far out on the ocean. The third Chinese brother was thrown overboard. Down he went. His smiling face was bobbing up and down on the crest of the waves. He simply could not be drowned. Everybody was very angry and they all decided he should be burned. On the morning of the execution, the third Chinese brother said to the judge, Your Honor, will you allow me to go and bid my mother goodbye? It's only fair, said the judge. So the third Chinese brother went home and the fourth Chinese brother came back in his place. He was tied to a stake. Fire was set to it, and all the people stood around watching it. In the midst of the flames, they heard him say, This is quite pleasant. Bring some more wood, the people cried, and the fire roared higher. Now it is quite comfortable, said the fourth Chinese brother, for he was the one who could not get burned. But everybody was getting more and more angry every minute, and they all decided to smother him. On the morning of the execution, the fourth Chinese brother said to the judge, Your Honor, will you allow me to go and bid my mother goodbye? It's only fair, said the judge. So the fourth brother went home, and the fifth Chinese brother came back in his place. A large brick oven had been built on the village square, and it had all been stuffed with whipped cream. The fifth Chinese brother was shoveled into the oven right in the middle of the cream, and the door was shut tight, and everybody sat around and waited. There they are, shoveling him into the oven. They were not going to be tricked again, so they stayed there all night and a little after dawn just to make sure. Then they opened the door and pulled him out. He shook himself and said, my, that was a good sleep. Everybody stared open mouth and round eyed, but the judge stepped forward and said, we have made tried to rid you in every way possible and somehow it cannot be done. It must be that you are innocent. Yes, yes, shouted all the people. So they let them go and he went home. Oh, good job. This is the best. And the five Chinese brothers and their mother all lived happily together for many years. The end. Thank you. Bye, everybody. I enjoyed that story. Wow, the five Chinese brothers, my goodness, they are some stubborn ones. It's impossible to beat them, you know? That's what happened when family gets together. You all survive through and through. That was a great story. Next, remember how uh, in the beginning I mentioned that there was a student that was sick and then is uh, exchanged out with a different student that had to finish football practice? Now we have Jaden here to... Sign the giving tree. Jaden, can I get a Jaden? Going once, going twice. Here you are, Jaden. Perfect timing. Great. Thanks for watching. I'm going to tell the story about the giving tree. Once there was a tree. <laughs> and she loved a little boy. And every day the boy would come. and he would gather her leaves. And make them into crowns and play king of the forest. He would climb up her trunk and swing from her branches and eat apples. And they would play hide and go seek. And when he was tired, he would sleep in her shade. And the boy loved the tree 
very much, and the tree was happy. But time went by, and the boy grew older. And the tree was often alone. Then one day, the boy came to the tree, and the tree said, come boy, come and climb up my trunk and swing from my branches and eat apples and play in my shade and be happy. <coughs> I'm too big to climb and play, said the boy. I want to buy things and have fun. I want some money. Can you give me some money? I'm sorry, said the tree, but I have no money. I have only leaves and apples. Take my apples, boy, and sell them in the city. Then you will have money and you will be happy. And so the boy climbed up the tree and gathered her apples and carried them away. And the tree was happy. But the boy stayed away for a long time and the tree was sad. And then one day the boy came back to the tree and shook with joy and she said, come boy, climb up my trunk and swing from my branches and be happy. I am too busy to climb trees, said the boy. I want a house to keep me warm, he said. I want a wife and I want children. And so I need a house. Can you give me a house? I have no house, said the tree. The forest is my house, but you may cut off my branches and then build a house. Then you will be happy. And so the boy cut off her branches and carried them away to build his house. And the tree was happy. But the boy stayed away for a long time, and when he came back, the tree was so happy she could hardly speak. Come, boy, she whispered, come and play. I am too old and sad to play, said the boy. I want a boat that will take me far away from here. Can you make, give me a boat? Cut down my trunk and make a boat, said the tree then you can sail away and be happy. And so the boy cut down her trunk and made a boat and sailed away. And the tree was happy, but not really. And after a long time, the boy came back again I am sorry, boy, said the tree, but I have nothing left to give you. My apples are gone. Oh, my teeth are too weak for apples, said the boy. My branches are gone. You can't swing on them. I am too old to swing on branches, said the boy. My trunk is gone. You cannot climb. I am too tired to climb, said the boy. I'm sorry, sighed the tree. I wish that I could give you something, but I have nothing left. I'm just an old stump. I'm sorry. I don't need very much now, said the boy. Just a quiet place to sit and rest. I'm very tired. Well, said the tree, straightening herself up as she could. Well, an old stump is good for sitting and resting. Come, boy. Sit down and sit down and rest. And the tree was happy. The end. Thank you for watching. Round of applause. I always enjoy the giving tree.
That is one of my favorite stories growing up. Next, we have Jasmine Hoddle. She will be signing the 12 Dancing Princesses by Hi. Allison J. Hi, my name is Jasmine. This story is The Twelve Dancing Princesses by Allison J. Long, long ago, there were 12 beautiful princesses. They did everything together and were full of joy, but they hid a mysterious secret. Each night, they slept in a long bedchamber, their 12 beds lined up in two neat rows. Although the door to their room was locked tight, every morning their satin shoes were worn with holes as though they had been danced in all night. When the princess's father, the king, asked what they had been doing, they always gave the same answer. They had been asleep, of course. The king was determined to discover the truth. He announced to all in the land that whoever could solve the riddle of the worn-out shoes could claim one of the princesses as their bride. But, if after three days and three nights they failed at their task, they would be banished forever. The news spread far and wide. In no time, a prince came to the palace, and the king welcomed him. The prince was confident and clever, and the king was sure he would find out the princess's secret. In the evening, the prince was taken to a chamber right next to the one where the 12 princesses slept. No one could leave or enter the princess's room without being seen by the prince. The prince took a sip from the goblet of wine the youngest princess had brought him. By sunrise, he said to himself, I will know the secret and shall choose myself a princess to make my queen. As the moon rose, he steeled himself for a night ahead. But long before the prince fell into a deep sleep, when he awoke in the morning, he saw that the soles of the princess's shoes were full of holes, just as they had been danced in. After the third night, the prince admitted he had failed, and the king banished him from the land. Thereafter, several princes spent the night in the palace chamber, but none could uncover the secret of the worn-out shoes. One day, many months later, an old wounded soldier passed through the kingdom. He, too, was headed for the palace to discover the secret of the worn-out shoes. Along the way, he met a wise woman. A word of advice, brave soldier, she said. When you have brought a goblet of wine in the evening, do not drink a single drop. Pretend to drink it and pretend to fall asleep. You will be able to follow the princesses wherever you go if you wear this cloak. The soldier was welcomed into the palace, and in the evening he was led into his bedchamber. Just as the wise woman had predicted, he was brought a goblet of wine, but he did not drink a single drop. Then he lay down on the bed and began to snore very loudly, as if he had fallen asleep. You can see the princesses dancing around, having a great time. Upon hearing his snores, the princesses leapt out of bed. They skipped and swirled, sang, and they pulled their ball gowns from the big oak chest. They dressed, admired their reflections, and tied ribbons in their hair. The eldest princess laughed. We will fool this soldier just like we fooled the princes. But the youngest princess was not so sure. I'm worried, she said. Something feels wrong tonight. There's no need to be afraid, the eldest princess reassured her. Listen to the soldier's snoring. When all the princesses were ready, the eldest clapped her hands three times. At this command, her bed sank into the floor, and a trap door flew open to reveal a secret staircase. Let's go. The soldier watched the princesses disappear. He put on his invisibility cloak and quickly crept down after him. In his haste, he trod on the dress of the youngest princess. She cried out, someone has grabbed a hold of my dress. You silly thing, chuckled the eldest. You're imagining things. At the bottom of the staircase, there was a forest of silver trees. The soldier broke off a little branch as a keepsake. Did you hear that? Gasped the youngest princess. But the eldest laughed and said, it's only our princes calling out for us. Soon they came to another forest of trees with leaves of shimmering gold and then to a third which sparkled with diamonds. The soldier snapped a branch from each and the youngest sister shook with fear. Don't be afraid, said the eldest. It's only the princes who are crying for joy. 
Before long, they came to a great lake. On the shore, there were 12 little boats with 12 handsome princes in them. Each princess hopped into one of the boats to join the prince. The soldier stepped into the boat with the youngest princess. The boat feels heavy tonight, grumbled the prince as he struggled to row over the water. Across the lake stood a magnificent castle from which the sound of beautiful music arose. All night long, the princesses danced with their princes and the invisible shoulder, soldier danced with them. He was enchanted by the grace and beauty in each and every princess, but the one he admired the most was the eldest. She twisted and twirled and her eyes twinkled. It was clear that she loved dancing more than anything in the world. After the princesses had danced until their shoes were worn to shreds, the princes wore them back to the lake. This time, the soldier sat in the same boat as the eldest princess, the one with the sparkling eyes. On the opposite shore, the princesses jumped out of the boats and the soldier raced on ahead through the forest of diamonds, gold and silver. He ran up the stairs through the trap door and into his chamber. When the princesses returned, the soldier was snoring loudly. You see, we're perfectly safe, said the eldest. The next morning, the soldier resolved not to tell the king. He was eager to join the princesses once more on their curious adventure. He followed them that evening and the evening after that. Together, they danced through the night as the moon shone bright over the shimmering lake. After the third night, the soldier knew he must recall or he would be banished forever from the land. The next morning, the soldier was brought before the king. The 12 princesses listened at the door as he told their father all that had happened and presented with three glittering branches. The king called for the princesses and asked them if the soldier spoke the truth. When they saw their secret was out, the eldest daughter bravely stepped forward and confessed it all. The soldier chose the eldest princess as his wife, for she was the boldest and most courageous, and her eyes twinkled like jewels. They were married that very day. Everyone danced and danced at the wedding until all the shoes in the kingdom were quite worn out. The end. Round of applause. So as this evening has been, a, been progressing, I hope y'all have all been enjoying yourselves. Next, we have Ryan Schlecht. I think if I spelled that right, I tried my best. I'm sorry if I misspelled your last name. And he will be performing the poem, Jabberwocky. Ryan, take the stage. Good evening, everyone. No one knows my last name. I don't blame you. <laughs> All right. As you can see, I'm going to be doing Jabberwocky. How many of you are familiar with that poem? A few of you. OK. And some, for some of you, it's new. It's a very old poem. It was written by Lewis Carroll. He wrote the book entitled Alice in Wonderland. This poem was actually in Alice in Wonderland. So I'm going to put that into ASL for you today. First, I need to explain a little bit. This poem will not make sense. You'll be watching and be very confused. It's true. Jabberwocky is famous for playing with English, playing with the words, making certain sounds and rhythm. And so when you read it, it doesn't make any sense. Lewis himself admitted, he said, honestly, I'm not sure how to interpret my poem. So I'll tell you, I'm leaving it up to you to interpret his poem. At the same time, I'm going to translate into ASL, and I'm going to leave that to you to interpret as well. Sounds like fun, right? Also, you might recognize one important thing about this poem. When I first, 
Was I the first person to translate this? No. Will I be the last? No. The reason for that, there was a man from Gallaudet named Eric Malzkuhn, who challenged himself to translate that poem. And that was about 1960s. And it became very popular in the deaf community. A while later, the National Theater of the Deaf, one of the actors there, named Joe Velez, actually did this performance as well with his own version of the poem. And each of those translations was very different. And over the years, different people have tried and performed their own art to translate this poem. So I might be the 50th person to try to translate this poem. If you want to see more work from other deaf poets, then I suggest you Google that and try to see what other poems have been translated from Jabberwocky. So now, this evening, I'm going to show you my version. All right? All right, the person who is clicking on the screen probably maybe not able to see what, what's going on and see when they should change the screen. So I'll, I'll give them a break on that. Twas Brillig and the slithy toves did gyre and gimble in the wave. All mimsy were the borogoves and the mombraves outgrave. Beware the jabberwock, my son, the jaws that bite, the claws that catch. Beware the juju bird, and shun the frominous bender snatch. He took his vorpal sword at hand. Long time the manzom foe he sought. So rested he by the tum-tum tree. And stood a while in thought. And as in uffish thought he stood, the jabberwock with eyes of flame came whiffling through the tuggly wood and burbled as it came. One, two, one, two, and through and through the vorpal blade went snickersnack. He left it dead, and with his head he went galumphing back. <laughs> and hast thou slain the Jabberwock? Come to my arms, my beamish boy. O oh, frabjous day, kalu kalay, he chortled in his joy. Twas brillig and the slithy toves did gyre and gimble in the wabe. All mimsy were the borogoves and the momraids outgrabe. I'm a little old. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Round of applause. Raise your hand if you understood the story. Do you understand the story? I mean, I see some people a little bit iffy, you know. Also, ASL definitely helped. Whenever I read the poem, it just went past my head. Next, we have Jessica Von Garrel signing the song, Just Stand Up. And I'm really excited to see her. I met her a long time ago in Gallaudet, and just, she is incredible. I am ready to get 
blessed again. Hi, everybody. Applause, applause. Let's keep this show on the road. You know that meme about the salt? Just keep that salt going. Now we're going to learn who put the pepper in the pot by Alma Robinson. Hello, my name is Alma Robinson. I'm telling this story, Who Put the Pepper in the Pot? It was written by Joanna Cole. Mama Sue and Papa Joe had a big old farm all coming up weeds. They had an old house all peeling off paint and they had a bunch of kids all growing up faster than their clothes. 
They lived on hard work and sweetened with love. One day, a letter came. Rich Aunt Tootie was coming for dinner. Tootie's used to a fancy life, worried Papa Joe. What will she think of our poor place? We may be poor, said Mama Sue, but we can cook up a hearty stew as good as Tootie's ever tasted. Everyone helped. Papa Joe got the meat, Sam chopped onions and potatoes, Toby and Jane sliced carrots. They put everything in the pot with some water and Mama Sue put the pot on the fire. Then Papa Joe said, now for the chores. Everybody got to work. Mama Sue was washing clothes on the porch when she heard the stew say, bubble, bubble. She remembered that she had not put any pepper in the pot. And how in the world can a stew be hearty without pepper? Hey, Joe, Mama Sue called. Will you put some pepper in the pot? I can't now, Sue, called Joe from the woodpile. I'm chopping wood. Oh, fiddle, said Mama Sue. Bubble, bubble, said the stew a little louder. Hey, Sam, called Mama Sue. Will you put some pepper in the pot? I can't, Ma, yelled Sam from the front porch. I'm polishing windows. Oh, faddle, said Mama Sue. Bubble, bubble, said the stew, even louder. Toby, Jane, called Mama Sue. Will you put some pepper in the pot? We can't now, Ma, yelled Toby and Jane from the yard. We're cutting grass. Oh, twiddle, said Mama Sue, but she was all in soap suds up to her elbows, so she couldn't put pepper in the pot. Bubble, 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 grumbled the stew. A little later, Papa Joe said to himself, I'm finished chopping. I'd better put that pepper in the pot. And he went into the kitchen and put in a pinch of pepper. A little later, Sam said to himself, I'm finished polishing. I'll put the pepper in the pot. And he went into the kitchen and put in two pinches. A little later, Toby and Jane said, we're finished cutting. Let's put pepper in the pot. And they went into the kitchen and put in three pinches. A little later, Mama Sue said to herself, I asked everyone to put in pepper and everyone said no. I better do it myself. It's a big stew, so I'll put in extra. She went into the kitchen and put four pinches of pepper into the pot. That'll make it hearty, said Mama Sue. By dinner time, the clothes were clean, the grass was cut, the wood was chopped, the windows were shiny, and the stew smelled mighty hearty. And in came Aunt Tootie, all dressed up and hungry as a bear. They kissed her hello, gave her the best chair. They gave her the plate without the crack, and Mama Sue dished out the stew. <laughs> to be polite, everyone waited for Aunt Tootie to begin first. She lifted her fork and took a bite. And Oh, what a face she made. She breathed some air, drank some water, and she shed some tears. Then she looked around the table. Who put the pepper in the pot, she roared. Everyone answered at once. I put the pepper in the pot, said Mama Sue and Papa Joe and Sam and Toby and Jane. They all took a bite. Yow! They looked at Tootie's face. She was frowning, but Toby and Jane saw a little smile try to peek through. Then a little giggle came out, 
and a bigger giggle, and then a great ha ha ha. Pretty soon everyone was laughing. We can't eat that stew, said Papa Joe. Let's make something else, said Mama Sue. We'll make my famous omelet, Egg Supreme, said Aunt Tootie. Tootie took off her shoes. She put on an apron. She called for eggs. She called for onions. She called for parsley, basil, potatoes, salt, and pepper. What? Pepper! Sorry, Aunt Tootie. There wasn't a pinch of pepper left in the whole house. Thank goodness. Thank you. <clears throat> that was a funny story. I'll have to keep that in mind next time I'm using the pepper. Just one little dash of it, that's it. So ASL Expressions, the show tonight, is over. I want to thank all the performers, all the poets, all the storytellers, now we have one more song that's going to be performed in ASL. And I'll have to watch all of you. Oh, after watching all of you, I'm like, ooh, it's tough for me to be at the end. But we will have one more performer, and then that'll be it.
that's a wrap. I hope that all of you stay blessed and enjoy your night. Thank you so much for coming, and thank you for giving your heart and soul and your attention to all the performers and performances tonight. It just makes me feel amazing to see all of you. Take care. Have a safe evening. Thank <laughs> you.